And, um, you know, I, I, I love the fact that there are a lot of aspects of this, and I've been lif- listening to different teachers um, who can teach the history and teach the different aspects of this. And I'm, I'm not that kind of teacher, but I want to do a little bit of that today because I want you to see some things. Um, you know, everything we have to understand, everything about Jesus from birth to death was about us. Did you know that? The Bible says very clearly that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And so when we go into this, uh, you know, a lot of people consider it the Holy Week here. Um, you know, let's, let's uh, be in remembrance of everything that has been done from the birth of Christ and, and, and through the death and resurrection of Christ and understand the power that is in that. It makes all the difference in the world. It sets everything in a different order, doesn't it? You know, because I, I remember years ago I heard one um, evangelist, he said he was in another country, and he said they had this great place where people would go, and, and they would just stand, and they would, they would look at this thing, and he had this, this massive chandelier, and, and it was, he said it was glorious. He said it had to cost, you know, millions of dollars. And he said it come down, and there, there was a point, and it was hanging about three or four feet off the floor, and the point was, was of that chandelier was, was pointing to a point on the floor, you know, a particular spot. And he said he noticed people were coming to that spot, and they were stopping, and they would pay homage to that spot. You know, and he said he, he didn't know what all it, was, all it was about. So he said he went up to somebody and asked him. He said, what's going on? And he said, the guy says, oh, you, you have to understand. He said, that's where my Lord is buried, my God. And he said, as I got to question them, they were all serving a false god. And he said the guy had died, and they built this chandelier to point right to where his nose was in the grave. And they would all come to that spot, and they would worship at that spot because their Lord and their God was there. And he said, I'm standing there, and he said, I'm looking at this spot, you know, where this thing's pointing. He said, and I look at the people around me and say, but let me tell you about one who's not in the grave. Come on, y'all. It separates it all, doesn't it? This changes everything, doesn't it? And we'll get into that next week. I don't know why I went there right now. But, but anyway, we're talking today of, uh, on Palm Sunday about, um, you know, the entry of Christ into the city. If you will, go to Acts 3. And we're gonna, I'm going to start off a little different. We're not going to read that story first or that portion of Scripture first. We're going to go a little different here. I, I felt led to do things just slightly different. And um, because I think it's important for us to understand that, that Christ came to set us free. Christ came to give us something different. Do you understand? Um, you know, I see so many times that people are talking about, hey, how can we overcome everything that's going on in the world? How many of you know the world's going nuts? And the news media is not pointing a lot of this stuff out. I, I need you to know that. None of them are. You know, and, and uh, we, you know, I can, I can participate in other news organizations to where they'll tell you everything that's going on and everything that's happening and everything that's happening in America. And, uh, and a lot of what's happening in America is not being shown to the American people. A lot of it is not being produced and put out because they don't want people to understand everything that's happening. Now, I, I, I do understand this, though. When I was thinking about this sermon, I, I said, you know, it's amazing to me how many times we will try to, to treat the symptoms of humanity. We'll look at everything going on and we try to treat the symptoms and we try to overcome it in every way we can think of in the natural. Stick with me here, y'all. But how many of you know you're not going to stop it and cure it until you deal with the cause? The way you cure is you have to deal with what's causing the sickness. Maybe that's what I should have titled today. Anyway, today's title is The Day Jesus Met Our Needs, Not Our Expectations. Now think about that. The day that Jesus met our needs, not our expectations. So treating the symptoms is not a cure. We must treat the cause. So listen to this. In Acts 3 and verse 1, we're going to read 1 through 8. It says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prey, the ninth hour, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, everybody say Beautiful, to ask alms of those who entered the temple, 
who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. Everybody say alms. Now, how many of you know money is not the, the cure? Have you noticed this? You know, I, I, you know I, I talk with people all the time, and they say, you don't understand, Pastor, if I just had more money. Now, how many of you know money is not evil? Come on, let me try it over here. <laughs> money is not evil. Have y'all figured that out yet? But, you know, you, the love of money will cause people to do all kinds of things, isn't it? You know, I think I've shared this story. I had a man come to me one time, not here, in another church, so I can talk about him, okay? And, uh, but he came to me, and he said, I want you to pray for me. He said, we need a van. This is when minivans were first coming out, you know, and they were, how many of you know, thank God I'm out of that day where I don't have to drive minivans anymore. Anybody else glad of that? I mean, there, there's nothing wrong with minivans, but, um, but we just, we, Lord, God outgrew them. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so he told me, he said, he said, pray for me that I, well, the first thing I, I do before I pray for somebody to get something like that, I ask them a simple question. And how many of you know what that is? As a pastor, it's not that I'm trying to pry into their business or anything, but if I'm going to come into agreement with something for you, I need to know that you can handle it. So I asked him a question. I said, can you pay for it? Oh, yes, sir. We got it all figured out. I said, okay. So I took his hand. And I came in agreement. I'm not embarrassing you by doing this, right? Okay. I took his hand and I came in agreement. And I said, Father, I thank you right now. I line up with his faith and bless him with a van. How many of you know God honors that? Well, he got a van. I mean, it was nice, man. They were driving it to church. Everything was. And then all of a sudden I noticed she was coming to church and he wasn't coming to church anymore. He wants us to do this kind, kind of thing. Man, he didn't tell us. He didn't tell us, hey, I'm going to set you free so you can struggle. And he set us free so we could walk in freedom and liberty. And then the Bible say that who the Son sets free is free indeed. Praise God. Hmm. All right, let's do it again. Luke 17, verse 11. I'm going to preach this thing, I'm telling you. We'll get here to the entry in just a little bit. This is Miss Barber's fault. Why are you turning there? Um, yeah, I told Pam I was going to do this. So how many of you know I love my wife? How many of you know my wife loves me? How many of you know she has to or she would never put up with some of this stuff? Be honest, y'all, but don't be too honest, okay? Just be a little honest, not too honest. And, uh, but last night, you know, we, we had the funeral yesterday, and, and Miss Barbara and, and Jim let us stay with them and... and uh, Miss Barbara said, well, let's play some cards. And they taught us a new game. And what time were we playing last night, Miss Barbara? Do you remember what time it was? It had to be. Yeah, it was after, <laughs> yes, after Jim's bedtime. But anyway, they taught us this new game, 13. Am I right? It was called 13. It's a form of rummy. You know, but it's called 13, but it changes as you play. And, um, and my wife, you know, she knows how I am. Let me, let me show you this, guys. Let, let me, let me how, how many of you, your wives, cheat playing cards? Be honest. And then they act like they don't. Any, any of you rewrite the rules as you go? My wife is terrible about this because one, way, one time we'll play it this way and then the next time we'll play it a different way and I'll say, but that's not the way we did it last time. Well, but that, that's the rules. Well, how many of you know if the rules are constantly changing, it's not fair to me because I don't get to write the rules. I just get to follow the rules of the game. Well, last night, did any, I, I'm going to say it was around 9 o'clock or so, right? 9, 9.30. Did anybody feel the universe just flip upside down last night? Because let me tell you what my wife did. She did a, a move in these cards to where the card universe got off kilter. Does everybody follow me? And then we called her. Well, I should say she called herself. But we'd already played around, you know what I'm saying? So now I'm looking at her. I said, no, you threw the whole game out of whack. I'll get it. Uh, this is going to tie in with the sermon, so just listen. You threw the whole game out of whack. And see, and Miss Barbara finally looked at me and said, Pastor, what do you want us to do? And, of course, I'm, I'm thinking we need to start the game over. Because now there's no way to, listen, y'all, there's no way to get it back on track because cards have been played. And because that card was played and was not supposed to be played, listen, the next card played, 
there's no way to go back and do it right. So the whole universe of the game twisted. This is what the enemy does in our lives. He comes in and he causes one thing to get out of whack. And it shifts our universe of faith. Now, we were playing around. I was, well, kind of. I was playing around. But here's the thing, guys. You know what Jesus did when he came? He took the whole universe, spiritual universe, that was shifted out of phase. And he said, in this one act that I do, this is what God said, I'm going to put it all back in place. And our whole universe changed. Do you realize this? Everything changed for us. And I was picking at my wife. I always pick at her about cards. You know, but I, I want you to see this. If you will, go into um, Luke 17, and we're going to start off in verse 11. How many of you thank God for the work that was done through Jesus? Amen? And we're going to look at that in depth next week, and, and I hope you're excited about it. You know, next Sunday, you know, we'll be participating in or taking communion. Um, you know, I've had people ask me before, why don't we do communion more than what we do? And I always explain to people I want it to stay precious. I, I don't want communion to become a ritual for us, just something that we do. Do you understand? I want it as a body of Christ to be precious, and, and I think I've shared this with you, but one of the, some of the most wonderful things that I've ever uh, participated in in communion is when you made it less about you and made it more about somebody else. You know, it, it really changed everything for me. But listen to what it says here in Luke 17 in verse 11. It says, Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered the sit certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. Everybody say afar off. Anybody know why they stood afar off? Why? Say it again, y'all. They were unclean. This was the custom. This was the law. They stood afar off. In verse 13, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priest. Why did he do that? Huh? Now, why did he tell them to go show themselves to the priest? Because it was the law. The only way they could be declared fit to be back in public and not stand away from people was the priest had to declare them clean. Okay? Clean. Everybody say clean. All right? He said, go show yourselves to the priest. So it was that as they went, they were cleanse how many of you know this is the power of god in operation do you realize this guys i mean I, I, you'll see where this ties in here in just a minute i just want to throw a few things out i want you to see how how jesus is changing the universe the spiritual universe what once was man's and god gave man the right to mankind sinned and gave that authority over the satan jesus came and conquered death, hell, and the grave. And shifted that authority back to you and I. Do you understand? Now, this is powerful, isn't it? This changes everything because now I'm not no little weak Christian anymore. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. Now, what does that make us, y'all? That makes us a powerhouse of God in this life. So our universe has shifted. Do you see this? Jesus came back, and, I, and, and as I was reading this, and I don't have a full revelation on it, so I'm not going to comment on it a lot unless God just drops something in me right here, right now. But I want you to see this, and I'm, I'm going to mention a couple of things. That as, and it says, then one of them in verse 15, when he saw he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet giving him thanks. And it says, and he was a Samaritan. Verse 17, so Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? Everybody say cleansed. And he said, but where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Listen, y'all. Your faith has made you whole or well. 
Now, I like that word whole. But let me, let me tell you something that I saw last night. And um, like I said, I, I just want to throw it out there, and I'll, I'm going to study it out some more. But something that I saw last night was, you realize the nine were still going through the religious process. The one was set free. Just to the point. Listen to this, y'all. To the point to where Jesus told him, go on with your life. You don't need religion to tell you you're clean. Come on, y'all. You don't need the priest to clean you. God has set you free. And the Bible says he was made whole. Now, that is not the sermon today. That's just something I saw last night. How many of you can shout a hallelujah to that? Now, listen. It says, you know, Jesus saw them, and they yelled to him from a distance. And I love this. I mean, he, when, when Jesus looked at them and, and he said this, he, he said, you go your way and you go through the process. You go ahead. I've, I've cleansed you. I've made you well. You understand? But you go through the process so you can join society again. You go ahead and you let the priest tell you you're clean. You go ahead and you go through that process. But one man, one man came back. And one man was changed. It didn't mean the others weren't cleansed. I just want you to see this. They, they were cleansed. But I love the Bible says that he was made whole. But when you study that, you have been made whole, this is what it says. And this is where I'm going to go to something different, okay? This is what it says. Your faith has saved. Your faith has saved you. Now, somebody say amen. So look here. Honoring Jesus breaks the process of normal spiritual things and natural things happening in my life. You know, I can't tell you how many times that I've had people come up to me and tell me, well, you know, when you get a full understanding of God, you just have to understand God's providence. You have to understand his sovereignty and, and you know, and all this kind of stuff. And they start trying to get into all the religious side of this thing. You know, and I tell you, I've had people tell me before, you know, I, I never was funny by, I mean, I, I never was comical growing up. I mean, I just didn't have any reason to be. You know, I, I didn't, I mean, I wasn't joyful. I was bashful. I mean, I, I just, I was weird. I mean, I'm telling you guys, I was. And when I got saved, how many of you know, God did, didn't only change me on the inside, but it started bleeding on the outside of me. It made me different than the person I used to be. You know, and I even had people say, is this that little shy Rick? Or Ricky, they call me Ricky. Is this that little shy Ricky that used to be around? And now, all of a sudden, I'm going in and I'm telling people about Jesus. And they, my family and friends did not understand that. You know why? Because when Jesus sets you free, he changes everything about you. And, and I actually had people who were religious come up to me and tell me, you know, just give it time and you'll settle down and mold. Yeah, yeah, that's the way I say it. You'll get all moldy. You'll be like the other moldy Christians around you. Fungi, you know, and not doing anything, just kind of spilling a seat and, you know, not ever accomplishing anything for God. And I remember one woman told me, she prophesied over me, she said, you're too joyful. And the Lord wants you to stop being so joyful. And I looked at her and I said, why would God do that to me? You know, I never have had much cooth when it comes to that kind of stuff. I said, why would God do that to me? I said, what you're seeing is what God made. So why would he make me this way and then tell me, no, now you got to stink? No. God does not do that. Amen. Let's get into the triumphal entry. You ready? I got 10 minutes. To do it. <laughs> Matthew 21. You getting anything at all, guys? I just want you to see this. The work that Jesus started, it was not something that was just finished and done away with. That work is still going on today. Isn't that an amazing thing? Y'all, the same Jesus who set us free is still setting us free today. Changing lives of people today. You know, I am um, yesterday... You know, I, I, told, I told the Lord before the funeral, I hope this is okay for me to talk about, but um, 
yeah, I, I really struggled with doing that funeral yesterday. I really did because I was trying to figure out how to do it in my head. I was trying to figure out how do you, you know, you got family, you got friends, you got people who have been hurt. You understand? I mean, I mean, this is, and, and I was trying to do this thing in my head. And finally, this week, I, I went through Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and I was, I just finally had to get out of my head, and I had to get in my spirit. You know, and, um, and Pam had said something. You know, she's been, she's been teaching on the speech reach, and what she said is somewhere along the line, you're at one of these places. You're either reaping the harvest for the kingdom, you're watering a seed, or you're planting a seed. But you're in one of those three places whenever you witness. Do you realize that? You're either, if you don't harvest it, then you have to look at it as not defeat. You just watered it or you planted it. And I knew yesterday was going to be tough. And so, I mean, I don't want to go into a lot of details. When I found out some of the things after the service and some of the people that were here, um, we got an opportunity yesterday as a church body. You need to see this in the spirit, to plant seed in people's lives. I'm talking about people who were dealers. Come on, y'all. We got an opportunity to plant seed. And I remember when I found out about that, I, I you know, my flesh was struggling Come on, y'all, I'm being honest. You know, you struggle in the flesh. But you know what? God loves that person. Do you understand? And I'm believing for yesterday, and that's why I give an altar call at the funeral yesterday, is because I'm believing for lives to change. You guys, we don't fight this thing just in the natural. You understand? We fight it in the spirit. Now, when, when we look at this, I, I, I want you to see this. It says... Um, let me make sure I'm at the right place. Hang on. Yeah, Matthew 21, verses 1 through 17. And I'll read this, and then we'll close, and we'll get into the rest of this next week because next week is Easter. Everybody say hallelujah. And this is the time of, of celebration for us. Listen to what it says in verse 1. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to, to Beth... Say it, babe. Yeah, there you go. At the Mount of Olives... Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find the donkey tied in a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. Everybody say that with me. The Lord has need of them. And immediately they will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, a foal of a donkey. Verse 6, So the disciples, when they did as Jesus commanded them, they brought the donkey and the colt, colt and laid their clothes on them and set him on them. Verse 8, And they were, there was a very great multitude spreading their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitude who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, everybody say Hosanna. Hosanna, the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now this Hosanna just literally meant, King, save us. I mean, that's what it is. God, save us. Let, let, we want to be saved. But what they were looking at was the natural. Everybody say natural. How many of you know they were looking for Jesus to come in and take over government? I mean, they were. They were looking for their king. Did you know to this day the Jews still set a place for the Messiah? Because they have not accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Now, we know there's going to come a time when they do. But listen to this, y'all. They still struggle. You know, and I was talking to Pam about this. Did you know the Bible says that they have blinders over their eyes and they cannot see the truth because that veil is taken away in Christ Jesus? Now, Jesus changes everything for us. But how many of you know he changed everything for the world, too? They cried out, save us. Say it with me, y'all. Save us. And, and I, I love this. You know, we're going to find out next week when we get on into this 
that the, what Jesus did was he'd come in and the first thing that he took care of when he came into town was he went to the temple and cleansed the temple. He set things back in order. Everybody say universe. How many of you know that spiritual universe began to come back into place? Now, we'll look at it in depth next week, and I want you to see this, but when Jesus came in, he came in to meet our need, not the expectation of the people. Now you understand the title. The first thing Jesus did was to cleanse, cleanse the temple. He did not go to government, listen to this, but he went to the temple. Jerusalem was looking for a king to lead them. Jesus came to fight our spiritual battle. Because he knows that if he can get us in the right place, then it changes everything about the world. Now, let me end it this way. Are you ready for this? You need to stop seeing yourself as someone unimportant to the cause of Christ. It's time for you to begin to see yourself important to what God is doing. And it doesn't matter where you are as far as your spiritual knowledge is concerned. I want you to understand this. You are valuable to the kingdom of God. Come on, y'all. You are valuable. Now, the enemy is very good at telling us how we're worthless, but God never does that. He tells us how valuable we are. And can I explain to you, and I'm going to close this way this morning, can I explain to you how valuable you are? Can I do it? Are you ready to hear it? You're so valuable, the Bible says, that God sent the best that he had the best that he had for you. Listen, when you leave from here today, you need to understand this. You are not insignificant to the body of Christ. You are valuable. Watch this. Miss Jean, you got your headphones on? Did you hear what I said? You're valuable to the body. How old are you? Eighty-six and a half. Listen to this, y'all. Let me tell you what this lady is. She is a powerhouse for God. Do you understand this? this? This is what I'm trying to get through to you. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your ability. What matters is the investment that Christ made into your life. You need to understand this. Jesus came to change everything about us. I don't operate according to my own personal ability. I operate according to God's anointing in my life. And that means sometimes, guys, he's going to put me around people where he has to step up my game a little. Do you understand? But he knows how to anoint you to fill that place. He knows how to set you in front of people and then bring you to the top of the whole mess. Do you understand? I prophesied one time, and I remember doing this over Miss Barbara, and I told her, I said, you're anointed to step in the messes. I think she looks at me now and says, I wish you hadn't have did that. <laughs> but let me tell you, she is. You know why she is? Because God wants to minister in the messes of people's lives. He's tired of the devil ripping them and raping them of everything that God says he says they can have. And the way we get them free, guys, is coming along beside them. The verse of Scripture I read yesterday during that funeral was that God don't leave us alone. He comes along beside us, and what he does is he ministers into us. He changes everything about us, and then he makes it so we can come along beside people struggling in the same way that we were, and we can bring them out of the funk that they were in. I mean, this is how God is. This is how God works. He wants you to understand, you are not allowed to leave out of here today thinking yourself insignificant to the body of Christ or insignificant in this world. Say it with me, y'all. I am valuable. Oh, come on, y'all. Come on, guys. Say it with me, y'all. I am valuable. Let's do it again. Are you ready? I am valuable. Please understand that God has invested, invested everything that he has into you everything as far as the kingdom of God is concerned into you and it's time for you to take your place will you say amen did you get anything today I hope so stand to your feet if you will give him a shout of praise it's fine